But I'm excited this morning. One more time. Anyone else excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. There's Marley. In case anyone was wondering where she went. Um, I'm excited today. And, and I'm excited this morning because uh, we're actually starting a new collection of talks today called The Content Life. The Content Life. Let me ask you, has anyone here got any area in their life that maybe they're not super content with? Maybe they've got a discontentment with? I know me personally, I'm not content with uh, the, the, the winter coat that I'm putting on. I need to get that taken care of. But right now, we, we live in a time in a place that, that makes it so incredibly easy to be ungrateful about the things in our lives. And with the holiday season approaching, I feel honestly that God is calling each and every one of us to begin to be thankful in everything that we do. In everything that we do that we're, we're thankful. The Apostle Paul, he spoke on the subject way more times than I can count. I, I went to Safford School, so I can't count that high, but... But I think a great instance that he talked about this was his letter in the church to Colossae. And in this letter, Paul, he was addressing a bunch of stuff like false teaching within the church, giving them instructions on how to present themselves towards each other and towards God. And in chapter 3, he had this to say, 3 verses 15 through 17, he said, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether it in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be diving in. We're going to explore exactly what it means to appreciate God's goodness. Because when it comes to gratitude, I believe it helps protect us from living lives of selfishness or lives of greed or, 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 or lives of pride while, while also enabling us to see the beauty in what God can give us. When we offer thankfulness to God for His work in our lives, it, it allows us to better find contentment in His love and in His grace. Amen? So before we fully dive in, I do want to, want to say that as I was preparing for this talk last week, I came to a conclusion, I came to a thought, and the thought that I came to is this, is that the process of growing up, it's kind of rough, right? Anyone else feel that in their soul? You Anyone else remember being a teenager? That transition from being a child to an adult, it, it, it's hard, it's rough. I, if you have a teenager, I probably don't need to be telling you this, but growing up, it's one of the hardest things that I believe we go through in life. Now that I'm fully grown, at least physically, I don't know about mentally, you can ask my wife about that later, um, but now that I'm grown and I've got a family of my own, I'm constantly filled with thoughts along the lines of, oh, mom and dad weren't lying about that, right? So that's why they told me that. I get a lot of things now. I understand a lot of things now. I get why, uh, for instance, brushing your teeth is super important, right? Because dealing with a mouthful of cavities sucks and root canals are expensive, Right? I get why eating candy for dinner is not a good idea because I'm still recovering from Halloween. I get why bath time is necessary because if I get let too many bathless days go by, my wife won't love me anymore, right? I understand it now, but I get these things now. But when I was a kid, man, I hated brushing my teeth. I hated not being able to eat whatever I wanted whenever I wanted. And I hated taking baths. I'm being serious about that last point. When I was in middle school, I thought I was the wicked witch, wicked witch of the West or something, right? If I got in the shower, I was going to melt, Just, ah, right? But it was actually a legitimate problem, like you're laughing. But my parents, at one point, they had to have a few sit-down conversations with me to tell me that if they could smell me, then it was way past due for a shower. In one instance, it was so bad, I, and I, I hate admitting to this, but I, I actually made someone throw up. Um, you see, I, I wear a lot of hats today. Um, I wear a lot of hats today because I'm insecure about my balding head. But when I was in middle school, beanies were my jam. And that was just because I was lazy. I didn't want to do my hair all the time. So I, I wore beanies all the time. And one particular beanie I would wear for months on end. And, and one day my mom takes me to the beauty college that my aunt owned at the time and, uh, to get a haircut. And we sit down and this poor high school girl comes over. 
starts getting me ready for a trim. She squirts my hair. And have you guys seen the movie Dumb and Dumber with, with Jim Carrey? You know the part where he's like doing that gag and things? That was, that was her for the entire haircut. I was so embarrassed to say the least. And, and I've taken at least one shower a week since then. You're welcome. If it's on Sundays. I actually showered last night, so not too far off the mark. But, but again, growing up, growing up can be hard. And I think growing up is so rough sometimes because oftentimes we don't have the right perspectives, right? Like my children, they're not thinking the same way that I am. To them, I'm a mean dad when I tell them that they can't run around in the middle of the highway, right? But to me, I'm a great dad because I don't let my kids run around in the highway, right? Like, it's, it, it's really simple to see from my perspective that playing in the road's a bad thing, but to them, not so much. And it's really easy to hear this, hear stuff like this. Like, yeah, don't let your children drink bleach. That's, that's you know, parenting 101. It's really easy to say, well, duh. But I want you to consider something this morning. We do the same thing with God all the time. We do the same thing with God all the time. We take so much for granted. So much for granted. Our jobs, our our houses, our children, our spouses. That was cool. I didn't mean to rhyme, but I'm going with it. Our cars, our our, our favorite knickknacks, our hobbies, our talents, our health. All of these things, they've got one thing in common. And that's they are all blessings from our God. But a lot of the time, we treat things like these not as gifts, more like entitlements, right? We treat them like we earned them somehow, when in reality, they're all products of God's blessings to us. But most times, we don't share that perspective. I worked for that money. I saved up that 401k to retire. So this morning, as we kick off this new series, I want to focus on this. I want to focus on, on how incredibly easy it is to view the things in our lives with a perspective that doesn't quite hit the mark, Right? How when we truly understand God's goodness, how it allows us to be thankful for the gifts that He showers on us. Before we fully dive in, though, let's open up to our God in prayer this morning, church. Join me. Father God, we are just so grateful for you today. We're so grateful for every single blessing. Though it may be small in our perspective, still a huge blessing from you nonetheless, God. And this morning, as we dive into your word, our our number one priority is to be more sensitive to the things that you've done for us, to be more sensitive for every blessing that you pour out on us, and that we can in turn turn it back to praise to you, Jesus. So we ask that you would bless this talk, God, that you would bless our times together, that you would speak to us in a new way today, God, that you would give us that fresh encounter with you that encounter that changes everything, God. And all his people said in his mighty name, amen. Amen. So if you got your Bibles with you this morning, if you're following along, taking notes, we're going to be hanging out. We're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And before we read, um, something I want to tell you guys today is this. We live in, we live in an interesting society today. An interesting society. We live in a society that if we're actually really able to take a step back and look at it for what it is, we'd see that we live in a society that's only content when we have more, right? Only content when we have more. We live in a society that believes there's always something better on the horizon. And because of that, we're always striving to have more, to have that next big thing, to have the best, the bigger houses, the nicer cars, the new phones, new computers, nicer clothes, right? And while having nice things is pretty great, I love having nice things. I feel like I look pretty fly today with my uh, Nike shoes and my cool cardigan my grandma got me at the thrift store. I love having nice things, but sometimes we have the tendency to compare what we have to what we want. I'm going to say that again. We have the tendency to compare what we have to what we want. And what it does is it makes us discontent with what God's already given us. 
But something important to know is this, that God wants us to be content with what we have now. In Luke 15, Jesus, in this portion of Scripture, he's actually near the end of his ministry here on earth. And and the Bible tells us that at that time, Jesus, he was traveling around Judea, he was teaching and preaching, and and that in the midst of it, a pretty significant crowd had drawn to him. And in verse 1 and 2, it says this, It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So the Pharisees are seeing what Jesus is doing, and and they can't wrap their heads around it, right? The, The guy who's claiming to be the Messiah to their standards, he isn't really acting much like a Messiah, right? He's surrounding himself with people who are undesirable, people who who they thought weren't worthy of their attention and time, let alone the Messiah. So in order to kind of break this down for them and and, and give them a change of perspective, Jesus, he, he actually tells a few stories or parables, as the Bible calls them. And the first story he told them was about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and he lost one. We sing songs about this one all the time. Hundred sheep, and he lost them. And instead of, of counting his losses, he actually leaves the 99 to go find the one that was lost. He tells another similar story about a woman who had ten pieces of silver and loses one, and instead of counting her losses, what does she do? She tears her house apart in order to find that one lost silver piece. And then Jesus went on to tell probably one of the most well-known stories he's ever told called the parable of the lost son. The parable of the lost son. And in this story, A young man, he tells his father that he was tired of waiting for his inheritance and he wanted it now. And the resulting story is one of the most prolific, beautiful metaphors about just how much God cares about his children. And it's this story that I want to focus on this morning because I believe it paints such a great picture about what it means to be content and to be grateful about the things in our lives. So this morning, I want to unpack this story, and I want to explore what Jesus had to say about this issue. So let's take a look uh, in chapter 11, or sorry, chapter 15, verses 11 through 12. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, let me give you my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So I think that needs to be pointed out is the fact in that culture of the day, according to Old Testament theologian, a guy named Brad Young. He said the son taking his inheritance before the father died was akin to the son basically saying that he wanted him dead. Right? Can you imagine that? A child telling you, Dad, I'm, I'm tired of waiting for you to keel over. Can you just give me my money now? Can you imagine that? What the father would have felt in that moment. Let's continue. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. So the son, he takes his money and he leaves. He thinks that his father is standing in the, his way between him and happiness. So, so he takes all he can get and he uses it on wild living. That's a pretty powerful phrase there. That, that gives you some imagery, right? I don't know about you. But to me, I picture freshman year in college on spring break. I picture Cancun and parties, inebriation, and bad life decisions. He took his money, this blessing, and he used it on these fleeting, momentary, wasteful things. And so, so, so many of us oftentimes can view the blessings of God in the same way. Many of us view the blessings of God that We waste the things that God gives us, things that we think will satisfy us, things that we think will bring us contentment, when in the end we're left with nothing. And the next verses detail this perfectly, in my opinion, verses 14 through 16. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to fields to to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So to recap, he left home with a fortune. A fortune. Though we don't know how long he's been on his own, we do know that it didn't last him very long. 
He squandered it. He wasted it on fruitless things. And and as a result, things started to go downhill. He went from having it all to losing everything. He had no home, no possessions. He didn't even have food. He was so hungry that it said that the the pig's food looked good. Can you imagine that? I've seen what pigs eat. I don't want to eat what pigs eat. In church, our, our world is filled with stories just like this. It's a tale as old as time, right? Men and women throughout history, throughout the ages, have taken the blessings of God and squandered them on useless things, and as a result, have lost everything. Just a moment, think of uh, people in pop culture, right? Elvis Presley, Jim Morrison, Bon Scott, Kurt Cobain, Michael Jackson, Amy Winehouse, Whitney Houston, Prince, the artist formerly known as Prince, Philip Hoffman, Heath Ledger, Chris Farley, Bruce Lee, Jimi Hendrix, Marilyn Monroe, Hank Williams. Just a couple of days ago, one from my childhood, Aaron Carter. All of these people, they died from various forms of substance abuse in one way or the other, and it's incredibly sad. Incredibly sad. What's even more sad is that these are just the popular ones, right? Countless people throughout time, sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, all with so much potential and wonderful plans that God had for them, their lives cut drastically short from what God had for them. It's heartbreaking. I'm sure every person in this place has been affected by the toll that things like addiction can bring. And I do just want to say just real quick, if you're struggling with addiction or or being affected by it in some way, Come talk to me. Come talk to our leadership team because we got resources that are out there that can help. But all these people, one thing in common, instead of running towards the things of God, they took a detour. Instead of running towards the things of God, they took a detour. Something else caught their eye and something else caught their attention. And, And in their discontentment with the things in their lives, they followed. Church, there's always going to be something that's vying for your attention. There's always going to be something that will catch your eye. But if we let discontentment into our lives, the more likely we are to follow after those things. These are extreme cases, sure, but, but the principle remains the same on a smaller scale. Failing to appreciate and properly utilize our gifts will entice us to leave them from one empty pursuit after another. Spouses who think their family are impeding their habit, their happiness. They, they have the, the tendency to become workaholics or even in severe cases, leave their families altogether. Students who think their college studies are a burden rather than an investment in their future. They'll, they'll spend their time partying and waste their time in school. Misuse of our talent. It doesn't always result in death, don't get me wrong, but it does often lead to broken relationships, squandered opportunities, and lost dreams. But even despite it all, despite all of the negative Nancy stuff I've been been saying for the past 10 minutes, I do have to say there is hope. There is hope. If you're feeling discontentment creep into your life today, there is still hope. Hope For some, yeah, it does take being at rock bottom to come to their senses. But I don't think it has to be that way. I don't believe that we have to experience the worst portions of our life in order to get back on track. Because when it comes to living a life of contentment, I believe it all amounts to a choice, a decision. Not always an easy choice, don't get me wrong, but a choice nonetheless. The son of the story... He was at an all-time low when he finally understood. But again, it doesn't take being at rock bottom to appreciate the blessings God gives us. The story continues with this in verses 17 through 24. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went back to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and 
kissed him, and it continues. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And church, this story is one of my favorites throughout all the Bible. This story is so powerful to me. And I say that because I believe it's such a good representation on just how much and how strong God's love really is for us. The son in the story quite literally expressed to the father that the only thing that he cared about was what the father could give him, right? Quite literally told him that he wished he was dead. But at the end of it all, the father's love for his son never faltered. It never diminished. It never ended. The father sat watching the road, waiting for his son waiting until his son would come home. For just a moment, I I don't have this written down, but I just want you to think about how many fathers, how many mothers waiting for their kids to come down that road. So many fathers and mothers in our world today don't even don't even know if their kid will ever come back down that road. They're sitting and they're waiting, and they're hoping and praying for that moment that they see them, even from that far away. The father he sat watching that road, waiting until the, the day his son would come running down it. All that needed to happen was for the son to change his perspective. To change the way he viewed things. He had squandered his blessing, but when he came to his senses and took on the mindset of a servant, what happened? He was given more. He was given more. He had no expectation of returning to his old life, but because his father loved him, he gave it to him, even though he didn't deserve it even though he didn't earn it. So many of us in this place, to some degree, are in the same spot as the son in this story. We've taken what God has given us, and instead of being appreciative or thankful, we've selfishly squandered it. We've selfishly come to the thought process that that I somehow earned this. This is my right. This is my inheritance that is due to me. selfishly squandered it to the point that now we're not content. Now we're not happy with what we have. Let me put this a little bit more into perspective for you. You're blessed. Incredibly blessed. Blessed than you can even, con- more blessed than you can even conceive. Let me put it this way. If you made minimum wage, And I'm not talking Arizona minimum wage. I'm talking federal minimum wage, $7.25 an hour. If you make that and you work part-time, 20 hours a week, you are richer than over half of our world today. Richer than over half of our world today. If you can go into your bathroom, turn the knob on your sink, have clean running water come out of it, You are more blessed than over half of our world today. If you make $100,000 a year, guess what? You're in the top 95% of the world. That's how blessed you are. It's hard to see sometimes, because why? We got bills, got 
house payments, got car payments, insurance payments, electric payments, utility payments. If you have a pair of shoes on right now, you've got more than 25% of the world. That's how blessed you are. Kind of changes things, doesn't it? changes our perspective just a little bit. If you've got a swamp cooler on your house, I'm not even talking a fancy air conditioner, if you've got a swamp cooler, it's more than most people in our world have. There's a billion people in India living in 100 degree heat. A little bit of a perspective change, isn't it, church? so easy to be happy or unhappy with what we have. We start seeking more and more until the world around us starts falling apart. Relationships end up being broken. Our lives can feel empty. And I think the key is understanding that these things in our lives, our houses, our jobs, our things, every dollar in our bank account, our families, every, every single breath that we take, Every time our heart beats in our chest is a gift from God given to us to bring praise and glory to His name. When we finally understand that, man, I truly believe everything about us will begin to change. We'll start thanking God for everything, thanking Him for every moment He has given us in this place that we call earth, thanking Him for for the outrageous blessing that is even life itself. If you're here this morning, and maybe you can identify some areas in your life that discontent has started to grow. Areas in your life that are moving towards ungratefulness. Areas that maybe feel incomplete or, or, or unsatisfied. Maybe this change in perspective is what you need. Maybe instead of viewing these areas in your life with with a longing for more, maybe you need to take a step back and realize how incredibly blessed you actually are. And maybe you need to stop connecting your happiness with more. I truly believe, you know, don't get me wrong, I love my country, I love my culture, but man, we've gotten some things wrong. Man, we've gotten some things wrong. When we began to tie our, our worth to our stuff, our worth to our bank accounts, man. It's not what it's about. And stop connecting our happiness with having more. Maybe, maybe we need to start to see how all of this, every single thing in this life is more than we deserve. Because I'll tell you, we're all, each and every one of us, prodigal sons and daughters in this place. Each and every one of us. We are all squandering the things that God has given us in some way, shape, or form. And I'll tell you, I think the cure, A, I think there is a cure, and B, I think the cure is is so simple, you're going to think I'm kind of dumb for a second. Because I think the cure simply thanks. The fix is constantly in every single thing we do. Simply telling God, thank you. Thank you, God. I woke up this morning. That's pretty cool. Thank you, God. Go to that minimum wage job on my feet all day. But you know what, God? Thank you for that minimum wage job that keeps me on my feet all day. So I passed 10 people on the way here that don't have one. You know what? I'm super grateful for it. Even though I, I don't always say it, even though I don't always feel it, God, I'm, I'm choosing to thank you for it. God, I thank you for my house. Yeah, it's a one-bedroom duplex. In the middle of the bad part of town, God, but 
Again, there's people right across the street. They don't have a house, so I'm thanking you, God. Who I'm so glad I have a house. Thank you so much, Jesus. God, I thank you for my car. Don't get me wrong, I really want a new one. But you know what? This Nissan Ultima from 1997 that I got up uh, to the top of Fry Mesa that one time, you know what, God, I'm still thankful for it. The AC don't work, but the heater does, and it's really cold today. So thank you, Jesus, for this car. Thank you for my family. It seems more often than not we're at each other's throats, but you know what, God? That junky car that I was just thanking you for just broke down, and my sister gave me a ride to work today, and I'm really, really grateful for that. You see, you see how it, how it does. When you begin to start thanking God, even though it's not perfect, even though it's pretty, pretty dang far from perfect, it brings a realization that, you know what? I really do have, have it better than a lot of people. Because I know people who have written their family off. I know people who have gone 10 years without seeing their mom, and their dad, their grandma. And you know what? I get to have dinner with them every week. I'm so thankful for it. Thank you, God, for having food on the table. Yeah, it's saltines and spam, but you know what? Still really good. God, I thank you for everything. I thank you for every breath. I thank you for every moment, every second that I get to spend on this planet these incredibly generous gifts, these outrageous, unwarranted gifts, God, I thank you for them. I promise you, when you begin to live your life like that, you will know what it means to live a content life. A life content with what God's given you. And don't get me wrong, it's not bad to want more. It's not bad to, to strive and to think, you know what, God, I, I really like those shoes and I really want them. Maybe someday I can get those shoes. But to think to yourself, you know what, I would be happier with those shoes. That's where the divide happens. Amen? If only I had those shoes, my life would be complete. That's the thinking. Do you need a five-bedroom house? Probably not. Your three-bedroom is probably more than enough for you. And yeah, maybe one day you can get that five-bedroom house, the two-car garage, and the boat on the side, right? Who wants a boat? Don't get a boat. No one ever wants a boat. Everyone wants a boat, but no one wants to take care of a boat. But God, I'm choosing to, to thank you for every single thing. That's what it's about, church. That's the first step in realizing a content life is to realize that your stuff isn't going to make you happy. That when we're grateful for the things God's already given us, then true contentment can happen. Amen? Would you pray with me this morning, church, as we come to a close?